Hey everyone, welcome to this week's conversation with Dr. Stephen Ned about the body and how to fix, protect, or maintain it using outside-the-box alternative solutions. If you're a big fan of the pharmaceutical or surgical approach, you are so in the wrong place because on this podcast, we're not going to be pushing the conventional medicine methods or way of thinking about health. If you're looking for another way to live longer and healthier, join me, Ron Ned, and my brother, Dr. Stephen Ned, for this week's body chat about how to avoid heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Me? I'm a retired Twin Cities chiropractor currently helping people buy and sell homes in the Tampa Bay and Los Angeles areas. My brother has a thriving chiropractic practice in the Clearwater area of Tampa Bay, Florida. In this podcast, we're going to chat about all sorts of topics related to health, nutrition, exercise, just about everything having to do with the body. You're invited to listen in to our body chat, but don't forget that neither of us is giving you health advice, so don't rush off to do something without either checking with your doctor first or seeing Dr. Steven Nett as a patient at his office. Good evening, Steve. Good evening, Ron. So the Cavaliers look like they're going to be going all the way in at least this series of games, isn't it? Yeah, they're looking really good. I'm very proud of them. That's good. It almost but doesn't quite make up for the Browns continuing to suck every year. Yeah, but they're going to be better this year, and I like what they did in a draft, and we'll see what happens. All right. Well, keep telling yourself that. So now let's move on to today's topic. We're going to be getting into something that's important since Florida weather can be kind of intense starting in May and especially in the peak summer months. So how does humidity level affect the comfort level and what are the negative effects that it can have on your body? Well, first of all, let's start off with what humidity is. Okay. Yeah. So it's simply the amount of moisture in the air. And since warm air can hold more moisture than cold air, it feels more humid as the temperature rises. And if it's both hot and humid, a person will usually feel hotter and much more uncomfortable. Okay. So let's break down what happens with the body first when it's exposed to high heat and then high humidity. All right. That sounds fair. All right. So when the air temperature approaches the body temperature of about 98 degrees Fahrenheit, the body does various things to keep it cool, including producing sweat, altering blood circulation, and increasing the breathing rate. Okay. Sweating only works to cool us down if the water that is released through the skin actually evaporates. And so this is where humidity now comes in. All right. So you may have heard of the term relative humidity. And not only is this associated with a higher chance for rain, but this also actually determines the rate that sweat or moisture can evaporate from your skin. All right. So can you clarify that some more? Well, when the relative humidity is higher, it's harder for the air to absorb the sweat from our skin because the air is holding more moisture. Mm -hmm. So an example would be, let's say you're working out in the gym and you're on a treadmill and it's 70 degrees in there and you're sweating as opposed to running outside and it's 85 degrees with high humidity. Okay. You're going to feel much better indoors because you're, you know, that sweat's going to evaporate much faster inside than it is outside. Okay. Yeah. Now what does the, why is it called relative humidity as opposed to just humidity? Well, the concentration of water in the air relative to the temperature is how they determine relative humidity. Okay. And again, that determines the rate at which water can evaporate from the skin. So when the air is holding more moisture, it's harder for the air to absorb the sweat from our skin. Okay. Yeah. So as a result, we sweat and sweat, but instead of feeling any relief, we simply feel hot and sticky. All right. So that's like comparing Tampa Bay at 85 degrees in August with a lot of humidity and Los Angeles at 85 degrees in August with practically no humidity. So the relative humidity, what you're saying is you're looking at at the same temperature, how much humidity or how much moisture is in the air. That's the relative humidity. Right. Okay. And then you would think that since you live in California and you're you're near the Pacific Ocean, your humidity level would be comparable to us in Florida, but there are several factors that make it more favorable there where you live. Yeah, like it being a desert. Well, yeah. Yeah. But another reason is the water temperature of the Pacific Ocean is much cooler than the Gulf of Mexico, especially in the summertime. 
Yes, that's correct. Another reason is that winds along the West California coast quite often blow west to east, which brings the cool air from the cool Pacific water on shore. Okay. And where I'm at, we have southerly winds often occurring that push the warm air from the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean northward into our area. All right. Yeah. Since high relative humidity basically eliminates the body's cooling ability of sweating, the body's eventually forced to do other things to cool us down. Not only are we more uncomfortable, but our core temperature starts to rise and our bodies compensate by working harder and harder to cool us down. And this can lead to some pretty serious health conditions. Okay. All right. So now let's get into some of the effects on the body. What is heat exhaustion and what are its symptoms? So heat exhaustion is a heat related condition and the signs and symptoms include heavy sweating, dizziness, exhaustion and weakness, elevated temperature, but this is important, it's less than 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And we'll cover why it's important uh, on our next topic. Uh, You'll tend to see, the person will tend to have headaches, they'll have a weak and fast pulse, rapid shallow breathing, very often there'll be muscle cramping going on, and a person will tend to be thirsty, And other things like vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, and tingling in the extremities can occur too. Okay. Now, in a milder version, can it just be the person is tired and headachey and not feeling well? Yeah, there's actually a milder version that we're going to go over later. Okay. Good. So then what causes heat exhaustion? Well, the main cause of heat exhaustion is the failure of the body's cooling mechanism, which we discussed earlier, is about the ability to evaporate sweat. Mm -hmm. In order to maintain a normal core body temperature, and this results in the body overheating. So this can occur in adults, children, and even animals like dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. And the various things that can contribute to heat exhaustion include working strenuously or exercising in a warm or hot environment, Mm -hmm. dehydration from not drinking enough water with electrolytes, Mm too much alcohol or caffeine intake, Mm -hmm. wearing clothing that inhibits evaporated cooling of the body. Okay. And those especially at higher risk for developing heat exhaustion include the elderly and children under five years of age. That makes sense. And the onset of heat exhaustion may be over the course of a few hours to a few days. So it isn't something that's going to happen instantly. Not usually. Okay. So now what's heat stroke and what are its symptoms? So heat stroke is basically hyperthermia in which the body's core temperature climbs above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the main difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke, that number. That's really important to know that number. And along with that, you'll tend to have inflammation throughout the whole body that can cause permanent organ damage and ultimately death. Not good. So that's a much more serious thing than heat exhaustion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's actually two types of heat strokes. All right. What are they? Well, there's a classic heat stroke, which typically takes about two to three days to develop. And it's most commonly found in elderly and sedentary people. Mm -hmm. And then there's exertional heat stroke, which occurs abruptly in just hours and affects healthy, active people like athletes, military recruits, and factory workers. Okay. So the signs and symptoms of the two types are usually the same, except with classic heat stroke, the skin is usually hot, red, and dry. Whereas in exertional heat stroke, the skin's usually moist with sweat in about 50% of the cases. Okay. So other signs and symptoms of heat stroke are low blood pressure, tachycardia, which is elevated heart rate, Mm -hmm. increased breathing rate, Mm -hmm. vomiting and diarrhea, And the hallmark of this condition is a change in mental status, which ranges from confusion or bizarre behavior to seizures or comas. Wow. Yeah. So it's really serious. Sounds like it is. Mm -hmm. So what causes it? Well, the causes for the two types of heat stroke are actually different. So I'll go over each one. Okay. With a classic heat stroke, it's due to extended exposure to high heat, again, usually two to three days which overwhelms the body's ability to cope with it. And it occurs during summer heat waves, typically in the elderly and sedentary people with no air conditioning and often with limited access to fluids. Okay. 
And it can also occur rapidly in infants, children, or animals if they're left in a hot car, especially with closed windows. That's what we hear about on the news. Yep. It can also affect those with chronic diseases like diabetes, congestive heart failure, or coronary artery disease. Okay. Now, exertional heat stroke is caused by intense exertion in a hot environment, which causes a sudden massive heat load that the body cannot handle. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what would be an example of that? So, yeah, an example would be uh, an overweight football player that just started uh, practicing the beginning of the season. He's out of shape. He may not have been properly hydrated. And so the heat load is really from inside the body and outside the body. Obviously, outside the body is the high heat and humidity, but inside the body, his metabolism is increasing. He may be out of shape, so he's not used to having that high a metabolic rate or the heart beating that fast, as well as the muscles contracting, which also causes heat inside the body to increase. So it's the combination of the internal heat and the heat from the environment that overwhelms his body. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's the exertional one. So now what should somebody do if they're having heat exhaustion? Because you don't want that to turn into heat stroke. So there's got to be something that they can do if they notice that that's what's going on with them. Yeah, there's quite a few things that can be done. First of all, you want to make sure you move the person to a cooler environment. So if they're outside, you know, go to the shade or preferably, you know, take them inside where there's air conditioning. And you'll want to use fans, maybe spray them with lukewarm water. And if you have access to ice towels, that would be really good too. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure they drink cool fluids that don't contain caffeine or alcohol. And the ideal drink would be water with electrolytes like salt and potassium. So Gatorade, which is not my favorite choice, is relatively easy to obtain and it actually does the job in that case. Right. Uh, another thing would be to remove excess and especially restrictive clothing that inhibits evaporative sweat cooling. Mm -hmm. And have them lie down with their legs elevated above the level of the heart and that'll help their circulation. Make sure you have somebody that's there to observe the person who has heat exhaustion in case he or she doesn't respond promptly because they might end up going into heat stroke. Okay. And IV fluids may be necessary, so they may need to be transported to a medical facility if their condition doesn't improve within a short time, let's say 30 to 60 minutes. And then one final thing is that animals that show signs of heat exhaustion should be treated in the same way as humans. And for dogs and cats, massaging the legs will help circulation and increase body cooling too. So how would you, I mean, what symptoms would you notice with the dog? Because for you personally, you listed the various different symptoms. It's easier to see, but a lot of those with an animal, you wouldn't notice. So what would be the key ones to look for there? Well, obviously their tongues are going to be hanging out and they're going to be panting pretty heavily. They might actually collapse and not want to get up. Right. Um, I mean, I've seen this in dogs outside and it's obvious that they've been out in the sun too long. So if you can't get your dog to get up and you have to carry them, that's not a good sign. All right. Well, that's good to know. So you have to watch your animals during this time of year too, not just you and your family. Exactly. All right. So then what should somebody do if they're having heat stroke? Well, the good news is that the current heat stroke survival rate is about 90 to 100%. And that's, that's good. Yeah, and that's primarily due to improved initial management with early and aggressive cooling measures. Mm -hmm. uh, since this is a medical emergency, 911 emergency medical service should be called immediately, not only to get immediate medical attention, but to have someone guide you on what to do before EMS paramedics arrive. All right. So that's going to be one of the key points is doing not just waiting for the ambulance to come, but taking some actions immediately with the person. Yeah, and, and I'll give you a couple things that are good to do. Okay. So again, you want to move the individual to a shady area or preferably to an indoor air-conditioned room. Again, remove clothing to their undergarments if they're wearing long sleeves and long pants. Mm -hmm. Apply cool water to the skin. So, for example, if you're outside, you can spray the person with cool water from a garden hose. Okay. And you can fan the individual to promote sweating and evaporation. And if ice is available, you want to place ice packs to the neck, wrists, groin, and under the armpits. 
Okay. Is that because those would cool the person off the fastest? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, if the person is able to drink liquids, have them drink cool water or electrolyte drinks like Gatorade, but again, nothing that contains alcohol or caffeine like an energy drink. Now, I have a question. You mentioned Gatorade you're not real thrilled about. Is Recharge still available? It is. Isn't that a better form of it than Gatorade? Absolutely. But again, you know, if you're in a situation where you have to get something quickly, typically you only find those in health food stores. Okay, that's true. Yeah. And it would also be wise to monitor their body temperature with a thermometer and continue cooling efforts until the body temperature preferably drops to 101 to 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, would you need to do it with an oral thermometer or those ones that go across the forehead? Would that be adequate? Well, really, the only way to test the accurately the body core temperature is a rectal thermometer. But again, it's probably <laughs> not real practical and you probably don't have one. So the second best one would be an oral thermometer okay. or, in, or in the ear. Okay. Yeah. Because I think the forehead wouldn't really register the core temperature, which is what's important. Yeah. And it'll tend to be lower, especially if the person is sweating. That's true. Okay. Good. So here's a really important point too. And that is if you are unsure whether the individual has heat exhaustion or heat stroke, assume that they have heat stroke since this is a potentially fatal injury. So when you call 911, they will assist you in making this determination. Okay, good. Yeah. Now, we were talking about this just a moment ago, sort of, when we were talking about recharge and Gatorade, but what are some natural ways to prevent heat exhaustion and heat stroke? Okay, well, the most obvious thing to do is to avoid going outside when the heat index and humidity is very high and to keep cool indoors. Mm -hmm. So I just use the term heat index, which I should also define. All right, good. Well, tell us about the heat index. Well, in simplest terms, heat index is the feels like temperature or how hot it really feels when the relative humidity is factored in with the actual air temperature. And the heat index is actually calculated for shade. So if you'll be exercising in direct sunlight without shade, the heat index may be as much as 15 degrees higher according to the OSHA guidelines for outdoor work. That's good to know. Yeah. And there are also rules now for certain sporting events, including outdoor high school events or practices, where when the heat index exceeds certain temperatures, they will actually cancel the event or practice and make it up on a later date. That's very good. Yeah. The American College of Sports Medicine says that the risk of exertional heat sickness is raised when the heat index is above 82 degrees Fahrenheit for people exercising for over an hour. Hmm. So that's why events like 5Ks and triathlons start very early in the morning, like at 6 a.m. Okay, that's why. Yeah. And a value over 90 should result in the cancellation of athletic activities for everyone and is an indicator you should plan a different workout rather than a long walk or run outdoors. And I'm guessing that when you look at like weather.com or any of those things like that, that they'll have a way you can find out what the heat index is. Oh, yeah. It's almost like the reverse of the wind chill factor from when we were up in Cleveland. It would be like the temperature is 20 degrees and the wind chill is five because the wind's blowing and it makes it feel colder. It has a more of an effect like temperatures at that. That's a good way of looking at it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So other things, when going outside for extended periods of time, when it's hot, you should wear lightweight, light colored, loose fitting clothing and a wide brimmed hat. Mm -hmm. Use a non-toxic sunscreen with an SPF of 30 or more. And we went over this in detail in the previous episode on sunburn and sunscreen. Correct. To prevent dehydration, drink plenty of water, fruit juice, or vegetable juice every day. And because heat-related illness can result from salt depletion, I recommend adding electrolytes to your water during periods of extreme heat and humidity. And my favorite happens to be Ultima. Okay. Yeah. And where do people get that? Uh, it's available in my office in one serving packets or 30 serving canisters. And it's a powdered form of electrolyte uh, that has six electrolytes and support minerals 
to help with hydration. As zero sugar, and they use stevia instead. Mm -hmm. And each serving gives you 100 milligrams of magnesium, 250 milligrams of potassium, and 55 milligrams of sodium. All right. Now, there are some times where people need to just be taking the salt, and sometimes people need to be taking just potassium, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, I know like Elsa does much better if she's taking more potassium. Taking more salt doesn't help her when she's having difficulty with the heat. Is that something that would have to be tested on somebody to determine whether they're going to need one more than the other? Yeah, that'd be a good idea. You know, and especially people with high blood pressure, they have to watch their sodium levels. Mm -hmm. But then we're going to discuss another condition where sodium is critical for certain people, especially when they're out in the heat. Okay. Yeah. So I found a really good general recommendation for those doing moderate to high intensity exercise in the heat. Mm -hmm. And that is you should drink 17 to 20 ounces of fluid two to three hours before exercise. And then consider adding another eight ounces of water or an electrolyte drink right before exercise. Okay. And then during exercise, you should consume another seven to 10 ounces of water every 20 minutes, even if you don't feel thirsty. Mm -hmm. And then finally drink another eight ounces within a half hour after exercise. Okay. Yeah. Now don't forget to avoid fluids containing either caffeine or alcohol, because again, both substances can dehydrate you, causing you to lose more fluids and worsen heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Right. And the rule of thumb is that for every cup of coffee or glass of alcohol, you should drink at least one glass of water to compensate for the water loss of each beverage. Okay. That's a good rule of thumb to follow. Mm -hmm. So that's some good ways to try and at least prevent heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Is there anything else you'd like to say about this topic before we end? Yeah, there's actually two other heat-related disorders that I thought we should discuss too. Okay, go ahead. Well, the first one is fairly common and is especially seen in athletes, and that is heat cramps. Hmm. Now, what are heat cramps? Well, heat cramps complete the trifecta of what are known as heat-related illness, with, of course, heat exhaustion and heat stroke being the other two. Mm Mm-hmm. So heat cramps are actually involuntary muscle cramps of the larger muscles of the body in the abdomen, arms, and calves that occur in physically active people in hot or humid conditions. Ah. Yeah. So they're they're the least serious of the three, but still may be very painful and alarming. I would think so. Yeah. Uh, Treatment of heat cramps includes rest, cooling the body, hydration with electrolytes, and stretching the muscles that are cramping. Okay. Now, a week ago today, during the deciding game seven of the Cleveland Cavaliers and Indiana Pacers basketball playoff series, Mm -hmm. LeBron James, who is undisputedly the best basketball player in the world right now, Mm -hmm. had to leave the game due to cramping, which he also happened to experience in a crucial playoff game in the past. So he went to the locker room for medical assistance, and when he got back to the bench, the cameras focused on him drinking Gatorade and eating pieces of an orange. Mm. And he fortunately for us Cleveland fans came back into the game in the final quarter and helped them win to advance to the next round. Right. So he was having heat cramps then. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So there's another less known heat-related condition that's called heat syncope. And syncope Mm. is a fancy word for fainting. How do you spell it? S-Y-N-C-O-P-E. Okay. Now, heat syncope is when a person faints suddenly and loses consciousness because of low blood pressure. What happens is that heat causes the blood vessels to expand or dilate, and so the body fluids move into the legs by gravity, which causes low blood pressure and inadequate blood flow to the brain, resulting in fainting. Hmm. Yeah. And just like heat cramps, this is not a serious condition, but it can obviously be unsettling and very scary. What do you think I had that happen? I don't know if you remember this. We were down visiting Aunt Sheila and Uncle Odie and all the cousins, and I think I was maybe 10 or 11 or 12 years old, and I got the flu. And mom's father, Grandpa Green, I remember we were driving somewhere, and I just puked all over the back seat floor of his Cadillac. So they took me to the doctor and I got a shot and we're walking down the hallway from the doctor's office toward the elevator. 
And I just dropped like a rock and I was dragged out and put in the car and taken back. And I spent the rest of that day in the, there was a bedroom behind the garage in their house in Hialeah. And I woke up like hours later. And I think that that might've been, cause it was warm. It was pretty hot. It could have been that. Uh, I'm just grateful. I wasn't in the backseat of that car. <laughs> you might've been actually. <laughs> I don't remember. Thank goodness. Yeah. Well then that's the good thing that you don't yeah. remember it. Well, when this actually occurs, the typical thing is to have the person sit and rest in a cool place. And you can also have them lie down and elevate their legs above the level of their heart to improve circulation. Okay. Sometimes low blood pressure is due to low salt levels. So it's good to give that person some salt and water and monitor their blood pressure. All right. And so if there's repeated episodes of fainting or if the individual experiences chest pain, seizures, or confusion, they should seek immediate medical attention. So do you think that that would mean possibly a heat stroke? Or some, some other medical condition that may need to be looked at that's underlying this. So in other words, the heat syncope shouldn't be something that's prolonged or more serious that like happens and it happened and you do the things that you recommended. But if you're doing, if the person's fainting more frequently and there were other things going on, then it might not be heat syncope. And that's why they should go see a doctor right away. Right. Okay. So those are the other two. So we've got a total of four. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we got heat syncope, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke with heat stroke being the absolute worst. That's right. Okay, good. So make sure that if you're listening to this, that you listen to it again and that you tell other people to listen to it because it's important that you don't mess around when it's getting hot, which it is starting to get hot now. And it, these conditions can be somewhat serious. So that's it for this week. Next week, we're going to be going into another topic. And this one's going to be important to listen to because it's about having a toxic body and how to detoxify and get rid of the toxins that build up in your body, which can cause all sorts of symptoms, illnesses, and a faster aging process. So that's what we're going to be dealing with next week. Thanks again, Steve, for getting all the information this week. You got it. And uh, next week when we record, you can tell us how the calves are doing too. Will do. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us this week on the Body Chat Podcast. We both really appreciate your time and your attention. We want to provide you with interesting and informative episodes each week. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover or any questions you'd like us to answer, send an email to us at info at bodychatpodcast.com. That's info at bodychatpodcast.com. To make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes, subscribe to the Body Chat Podcast now on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or Spotify. See you next week. <music>